Can he win an unprecedented fourth? And will the likes of Kenny Bernstein and Don Prudhomme stand in his way? John Forrest won his first Winston Funny Car Championship in 1990, but that second one can be even harder with the likes of Mike Dunn, Ed McCullough, and Jim White gunning for you. And what about Darrell Alderman? He came from nowhere to best the likes of 10-time champion Bob Glidden, but maybe Bob and Warren Johnson will have something to say about an Alderman repeat in 1991. In the next two hours, we'll answer all these questions, tell all the stories, and talk to all the personalities. Hello, I'm Steve Evans. And I'm Dave McClellan. And welcome to Drag Racing 91. Let's pick up the 18 race, $18 million Winston Championship season. Where else but at the beginning? The Winter Nationals in Pomona, California. At the 31st running of the Big Go West, there was a frightening moment in the opening top fuel qualifying session on Saturday. When former motorcycle top fuel champion Russ Collins pulled to the starting line in a brand new top fuel dragster, watch the bar lane. Russ Collins was to join the Blowover Club. The huge crowd on hand at the Fairplex collectively held their breath, concerned about Collins' condition. But as you can see, the chassis held up very well, even though it impacted both guardrails. Slowly scraped to a stop as the safety safari appeared on the scene. Collins unstrapping himself, and he exited the cockpit under his own power. Take a real deep breath to watch this replay, the most incredible one I think ever of a blowover. Look at this. Three and a half horizontal twists on that car. It slams to the ground. Amazing the big Goodyear tires were able to take that punishment. When I finally got down there and had a chance to talk to Russ Collins, he had a whole new respect for driving a top field director. You all right? I didn't embarrass you, did I, Steve? Not at all. You were spectacular, though. I liked that two wheels, but... When there's two on the front are supposed to be in the ground, it's kind of tough. I really never thought about it. I never worried about this car doing it. And I always thought, you know, watching Ormsby and, and Hill and the rest of them, I thought, I, I'll stop it. But uh, trust me, there is no way to stop this guy. Boy, there's no way. It, it is instant. One of the most incredible sights the world of drag racing has ever seen. Here's one of the most incredible drivers. Tom McEwen made his return to top fuel racing at the wheel of Jack Clark Mobile One car. Of course, Jack Clark, the designated hitter for the Boston Red Sox, longtime resident of Southern California, and a huge drag racing fan whose hero has been Don Garland. And the two finally met face to face at the 91 Winter Nationals. McEwen qualified in the 14th spot with a 5 5 9 and in the first round beat Gene Snow. Then in the second round, he lost to Frank Bradley. Bradley with an elapsed time of a 5 16. McEwen slowed to a 5 29. Surprisingly, for the defending Winston champion from 1990, Joe Amato, the Winter Nationals has never been his favorite race. He's only won it once, and that was way back in 1985. But Joe was full of confidence as he pulled to the line to race the bright yellow Pennzoil Super Shops car of Eddie Hill. But Eddie cut Joe on the lights. Joe spoke the tires violently. Eddie Hill was not to be headed at 592, a solo lap time, but he got the wind line, turned at 71 miles per hour. The finals in Top Fuel Eliminator found Don Prudhomme, who consistently ran 5-0s and a 4.99 in the semifinals. A solid performer all day long. Had some problems back in the pits, though, just before the start of the final round. They had to change a fuel pop, and the Skull Bandit crew did an outstanding job in even getting Prudhomme to the starting line to face none other than Frank Bradley for the championship at the Winter Nationals. Bradley, two days before qualifying began, was still at home in Northern California, wasn't going to come to the event. Some friends tipped in a little sponsorship money. There he was in the final round. Both of them backpedaling, heard him out of it. Frank Bradley won his first win in Nationals since 1976. I almost did, and I'm glad I came to Pomona. <laughs> you, you knew you were in tough against this, Nick. He had some problems, but still. Yeah, I put a brand new blower on it and figured I'd step it right up, but it did. It stepped it up too much and smoked the tires, but I guess he did the same thing, so. He had more problems than you did. That's it. Sometimes that happens, huh? Two drivers that had competed for Joe Pisano, Glenn Micra still drove for him at the Winter Nationals. He was the number one qualifier, raced Mike Dunn in the final four. 
John Forrest and Ed McCullough renewed the rivalry of 1990 with the result being just about the same. Now what we mean by that is obvious that John Forrest finished first in the Winston Points chase in 1990. McCulloch second here in the final four at the 1991 Winter Nationals. It was Forrest all the way as the last time was a 531 to a losing 541 by McCulloch. And in the second half of the final four, it was Glenn Micros in the near lane, Mike Dunn in the four lane in the Snickers car. Dunn had a huge advantage up of the starting line, but Micros had just enough of that famous Joe Mice on a horsepower to gun him down. At 528, 240 miles per hour, Don talked to the car owner. Joe, you've been coming to this race at Pomona since it started in 1953. You've seen it all, haven't you? Yes, sir. I've been, yes, I have seen them all. I've been here every time, every every race that they've ever had here. In fact, you won here in an A-Gas Supercharged. Yeah, and then they threw me out because they told me I ran too fast. Well, you'd really like to win this one this afternoon, wouldn't you? And your car is running good. Yes, I would, and this would be my second one for here because I won their 25th anniversary one. Well, we wish you the best of luck. Well, I thank you very much. Appreciate it. Micras had the lane choice in the finals against John Force. In fact, Micras had qualified in the number one spot, much to the surprise of everyone. But a supercharger explosion at mid-track put him away, forced the winner. John, what a way to start it off, huh? What a way, but these are friends. That if I was going to get whooped by anybody, this is the team I'd wanted to do it. That's the way it ought to be, the two quickest cars head to head. Let's They're bad. <laughs> You're bad. That's I'm a glad good you're okay. <laughs> The overall pro stock story at the Winter Nationals can be simply put, Darrell in the dominating Dodge did it again. 728s and 729s all day long to start the season as he had ended it, totally dominating on a single after Warren Johnson broke on the starting line. A 728, 188-mile-per-hour blast put the cherry on the sun. Steve, the next event in the 1991 season was the case of the famous lane-out at Firebird Raceway in Phoenix where they actually postponed the event for one week to allow them to dig up the starting line and replace the concrete. A good move by Charlie Allen, the track owner over at Firebird Raceway, because it made it into a competitive race. And a race that saw the emergence of a new top fuel driver, Craig Smith from Washington State. He qualified number 12 and was to become a major factor. His first upset was Gary Ormsby in round number one. For Gary, an extremely rare starting line full pop. Watch the green and white Castrol car in the near lane in the Christmas tree at the same time if you can see them both. There you go. Watch what happens to Orange Bee. For whatever reason, Gary left way too soon. Craig Smith just thundered down the race back to an easy victory. We talked to Gary. Gary, if that staging process doesn't go exactly right, it can throw the best driver a curve. Oh, it sure does. You know, I. Uh was all set up and then the light flickered again and you know when I see anything flicker up there I'm gone you know and this time it was just too early you know caught the race thanks in round number two Craig Smith came up again Frank Hawley at the wheel of Daryl Gwynn's Coors Light Silver Bullet and once again it was Craig Smith pulling off the upset Hawley came in the number one qualifier with a great 496 the only four in qualifying but Craig Smith on this day was not to be denied. Absolutely. When it's your day, it's your day. Frank Holly loses traction, gets it sideways. Craig Smith went on to win, but Coochie for the day, Gary Beck, didn't like what he saw. Well, Craig Smith will go to his first ever finals in his first ever year. And your first major engine explosion, a kaboomer. Yeah, I don't know what happened there. It blew the burst plate out of it. I don't know what to do now. I guess I'll have to go back and put another bullet in and go again, huh? Do you have the, that depth of parts? You fed it a lot the round before. Yeah, we still got enough parts to go another round. We should make it again. Hopefully for Pioneer, we can put her in the final and put a black cat in the other guy's lane, huh? <laughs> Boy, I'll tell you, a little luck and a little tenacity, you could do it. On the other side of the ladder in top fuel at Phoenix and the Arizona Nationals, it was Kenny Bernstein coming off an absolutely terrible year in 1990 when he finished eighth in the points, but he did make a big point here at Phoenix against the defending Winston champion. Joe Amato was the competition in the team Valvoline car. And Bernstein just nipped him in the lights of 499 to a quicker but losing 496.
You know, the early part of the season saw a lot of finals uh, just about in the dark, and Phoenix was no exception. Could Craig Smith possibly have put a black cat, as he said, in Kenny Bernstein's lane? Well, we watched. We tried to watch, actually, wondering how the drivers were able to see down this quarter mile. But Craig Smith could not back up after the burnout and the idle on down the racetrack, which gave Bernstein a bye run. But Kenny, the professional he is, blazed literally his way down the racetrack to a 5 0 1. You know, Kenny, it's important to win early in the season like this to get a run at a Winston title. Boy, it, it's a pain when you don't win early. It's a, it's really tough because, you know, everybody runs so good. There's so many good cars out here in Top Fuel that it takes everything you can do to make it happen. Celebrate. I'm going to. You can bet on that. And I'm going home tonight. <laughs> Kenny's first victory in Top Fuel moved him into contention with Don Prudhomme for the Winston points lead after Phoenix. Frank Bradley was third, Amato fourth, and Frank Hawley was number five. A very pleasant surprise at Phoenix in the Nitro Funny Car category. 20-year-old Del Worsham of Orange, California, faced up with Ed McCullough, number two in the world in 1990, Winston Points. The young Worsham had never driven anything but a Nitro Funny Car, and this was only his third national event in the family automobile called the Screamer that was in the far lane. Worsham took the victory in this second round race. It wasn't pretty, but it was worse for McCullough. An engine explosion and subsequent fire burned its way down the racetrack as McCullough finally brought the car to a halt. Thing went out, smoked the tires. I pedaled it. When I pedaled it, you know, it, it blew up. And, uh, you know, then the, the fire came. It was a pretty good fire, so. You know, main thing, get the fire bottles on and get it stopped, so. And they did their job. Yeah, they did a good job. Worsham's day came to an end in the final four in his race with Jim White. White, the number two qualifier, advanced to the finals to race against the number one qualifier, the Castrol Olds of John Force. Two races, John Force in his second final round. He looked invincible until he saw Jim White ahead of him by three car lengths at the finish line. It may be dark down here, but I think the happiness of Jim White will shine through. I'm just trying not to jump up off the ground right now. I tell you, the uh, the guys just worked so hard all day. Wes did a good job. Hawaiian Punch, of course, have been right behind us all the way, and uh, we can't say enough about all the guys that, that helped put this thing together. Roland's done a great job keeping Hawaiian Punch now for nine years. We're just real happy. We hope they keep coming for you, my friend. Thank you, Steve. Remember that name, Wes, Wes Cerny. He's gonna have a big role to play in this 1991 season. John Ford leading the Winston points chase after Phoenix. Jim White was second, Glenn Microson third, Mike Dunn fourth, Ed McCulloch fifth. The pro stock story was the same as the Winter Nationals, Warren Johnson against Darrell Alderman. Except in Phoenix, Warren Johnson didn't break before he got to the starting line. He indeed was there in his Oldsmobile, the blue and white AC Delco car again against the familiar Dodge Daytona Mopar part sponsored machine of Alderman. Now watch who cuts the tree down. Not Alderman, it's Warren Johnson away first. Johnson had a lead. Alderman was in trouble. Until the finish line, a 731 to a 734. Daryl Alderman, that's two in a row, and you're headed for Houston. The Fram Super Nationals, a track you've got to love with all your horsepower. Oh, yeah, the, the, Mopar, the Mopar Daytona really runs good at the Super Tracks. When it hooks up in second, it has good ET. And here at uh, Phoenix, we've been, we haven't been consistent like, it, like we will at the Super Tracks. And... We're just hoping for a good, good, good run at Houston. Well, a little dodge had carried Darrell to the Winston points lead after two consecutive victories. Warren Johnson was second, Jerry Eklund third, Tony Christian was in fourth, and Larry Morgan fifth. From Phoenix, our Mary Band traveled to the Gulf of Mexico. If you think Houston, Texas is always hot and humid, you haven't been there in early March, but that didn't stop a capacity crowd from filing in for the fourth annual Fram Super National. In round number one of Pro Stock Eliminator, the number 16 qualifier, Jim Yates, in the Fram Bendix Autolite Pontiac had his dream come true when he came to the starting line to face the number one qualified car, Warren Johnson's Oldsmobile, and a red light for Johnson gave the win to Jim Yates. 
With Warren Johnson out of the way, it was left to Daryl Alderman to slice his way through the field. His first victim was Mark Allen. Alderman, a strong 720, 189 miles per hour. In the final four, it was Alderman against the Chevrolet of Bruce Allen. The outcome the same as before. Alderman at 721. In the final, Daryl Alderman made it three in a row, beating Scott Jeffrey on. Great show, 719. 719. I, I knew it would be close to a 720 because when it leaves as hard as it left in low gear while ago and then it stays hooked up in second, uh, it's usually a good ET. First time bunny car winner at Phoenix, Jim White, qualified number one in Houston at a 523 in the Roland Leon car. In round one, he faced off with Chuck Edgels, appeared to be on his way to victory, when suddenly he was running a bomb. Edgels thundered by the winner at a 551. Now, what does a funny car engine look like after it has hydraulic, as that one did? Well, we're going to show you up close if we're rolling just a little too personal. The injector off the top of the floor, the impellers blown out the back, and Lord knows what the inside of the motor looked like when they took it apart. It seemed like the Roland Leon problems of old might have been back. For Richard Hartman, the Houston race was maybe a precursor of things to come and not very many of them were good in 1991. Chuck Etchell's victory over Jim White gave him the chance to race Richard Hartman in round number two. And there, Hartman struck the tires and struck the guardrail, first on the right-hand side, then the car crossed over, trailing fuel out from the fuel tank, got under the tires, and he slammed into the left-hand guardrail. Uh, I don't know what happened as far as hitting the throttle. I don't know if I trying to get back in it. I thought I had it under control. Uh, I think the reason it hit the throttle was it was up and you're probably bracing yourself in the car. It didn't go over, but boy, it was close. That very well could have been. I did my best. My hand came off the steering wheel of the, at the first shot and before it hit the wall, I got it. It hit the wall and nothing I could do after that. I just tried to, tried to save it after that. David, I believe this was still the only funny car with rack and pinion steering in it. It has been an evil handling automobile from the beginning, but nothing quite like this. Steve, his problems came when he first hit the guardrail. We think it stuck the throttle on him. Here, the fuel got underneath the tire. That's what caused him to take that dead left-hand turn into the far guardrail. In the first shot, you saw the safety safari man shooting the fire extinguisher in under the body. That was to shut the engine off. And what a treat, the fans got it used for the funny car final. Under the lights, at the ace, McCullough against John Forrest. The rivalry as intense as ever. McCullough had actually out-qualified Forrest by just one position. But in the final round, Forrest was not to be denied as McCullough breaks half the track. I'm really proud of these guys. Uh because I've rode him hard, and you know Coyle, he's a, just an old match race guy from way back, but he's one of the best, and uh, I love these guys dearly, and they worked hard, and when I fall down, they stick right behind me. They, You know, I was slow today on the lights. I don't know how I did, but I know McCullough's car was out, and I drove around him, and I've had a long weekend. I've been tired, and just to see the car produce like it did, I'm very excited for him. In top fuel, the number one qualifier, Gary Ormsby, had problems in round number one. This heavy air is really tough to deal with, isn't it, Gary? Yeah, I don't know what happened there. It uh, looks like it blew the blower a little It didn't blow it off, but it's something happened that backfired on me down through there. Yeah, we could hear it all the way down to this end. It got the burst plate, but it either floated a valve or went lean, probably went lean. I would imagine, yeah, that's what it looks like. Even though he popped the supercharger, he was able to take the round victory and advanced into round number two. There was a lot of work, though, from Lee Beard and the crew. Well, Gary Ormsby wasn't the only one to feel the sting of heavy air, cool weather, and a tight racetrack. Watch Joe Amato. Far more serious than anything that may have happened to Ormsby, and it cost Amato the race. He literally burned all 12 quarts of oil out of that motor. The parachute's off the car, but Joe got out without even a blister. He may have been okay, but I'll guarantee you, Stevie, blistered his pocketbook. Look at that. It blew the crankshaft right out the bottom of the motor. You can see the blower fully attached, all the rods and pistons. That is about as bad as it can get. That boat is hydraulic in an engine. The final round, again, under the lights. Dale Armstrong got it. Kenny Bernstein back. Could they make it two in a row after Phoenix? Kenny Bernstein against Gene Snow, a battle of the four second runners. Bernstein had qualified second. Snow in fourth. And Snow had problems right off the line. Bernstein runs his fourth consecutive four. 
No, you cut a 403 light. Now, Kenny, you and I both know there ain't nobody that quick. You better be careful. Oh, me. Boy, I'm going to get eat out by Armstrong on that one. He's not going to like that at all. He's going to say, what did you do, guess, or did you see it? <laughs> it's great. Great for the Budweiser team today and, and great for everybody here at Houston. I'm sorry it's so late, but, boy, it's been great for everybody. The celebration continued in the dark at Houston. The race delayed because of a mid-afternoon shower. Well, the Winston Tour loaded up and headed to try to find the sun in north central Florida at Gainesville Raceway, and sure enough, they did for the 22nd running of the Motocraft Quality Parts Gator Nationals. Now, David, as you know, Eddie Hill is always strong at this racetrack. He's the horse for this course. He qualified number one at 492 in round one, ran a 496, all in his old short car, the one he flew over a year and a few months prior to this race. But in round number two, he came up against Don Perdome. And this was not the Don Perdome we knew from the 1990 season. No, Steve, Don Perdome had acquired the services of John Medlin as his crew chief, and it did make a difference. Hill out with problems, Perdome the victory. Hill obviously disappointed. Plenty a delightful race has come to an end, unfortunately. A blower problem? Uh, yeah, kicked the blower off real early. I uh, don't really know why. That was totally unexpected, obviously. Will you stay with this old car or try the 300 inter uh, in the future now? I love this car. We're going to stay with this one. <laughs> kind of like a good old leather jacket. You feel comfortable in it. I feel real comfortable in the car, and it's never let us down. That's for sure. The low qualifier at 492. Adios. Steve, the car may not have let him down, but he certainly had an engine problem or two that made him away. Remember in Houston, it was Bernstein that cut that incredible 4-0 light. Well, at Gainesville, in the final four up against the motto, it was Joe's time for a 4-0. Like all of us, Joe Amato has been reading about those science fiction reaction times of Kenny Bernstein. So what's he do? Fires off a 4-0-1 reaction time and a 5-0-1 elapsed time. Yeah. Last time I beat him, you know, I ran 500s better than him, and he beat me with a reaction time. So I knew when I was up there, I was wired. I mean... God, I almost red-lighted, but God was looking over my shoulder, I guess. That'll give you a lane choice against this net. Got to be a great race. Yeah, it's going to be a good race. We're glad to get by Bernstein. You know, he's one tough hombre this year, and he's running good. And just glad to be in the finals. You know, we've been struggling a little bit, and I've been struggling. The car's been struggling. Hopefully, we'll be, we'll be ready to rock and roll. The Gator Nationals proved the turnaround for Joe Amato. His problems ended there. Prudhomme went up and spoke in the final. And Amato streaked to the only top fuel national ET record set all year long, a 4.897. A lot of the celebration for Joe Amato, who moved into a strong second position behind Kenny in the Winston points chase. Prudhomme was third, Hawley in fourth, and Frank Bradley number five. David, who would have believed that the invincible Daryl Alderman would be vulnerable at one of the super tracks, the kind of a racetrack that his Dodge liked? Well, Warren Johnson finally had his way with Daryl Alderman. Even though Alderman was first off the mark, Black Eyed Cat with a 4-2 reaction time, it was Warren Johnson with the big, big power. That power parlayed into a 7.27 elapsed time and a speed of over 189 miles an hour in a race that was decided only by engines. The margin of victory was so small, yet this man, you knew you won, Warren. Yeah, I saw the light just was across the line. You're looking at the wind light at almost 200 miles an hour? Well, you know, you got a little time in there. You have stopped the streak of the Dodge, and I, you're going to get a lot of pats on the back from the Gluttons of the world, too. I think this is all for the, for the rest of the races. Everybody was red lighting, I mean, doing everything that could possibly go wrong for them, and I think this is for the rest of the racers, because we knew we could do it, and I think the other racers are now going to finally say that, hey, he puts his pants on the same way as we do, too. Darrell Alderman, after four races in the 1991 season, had a comfortable lead, followed by W.J., Jerry Ekman in third, Allen fourth, and Christian number five. You may remember funny car driver Whit Bazemore from his incredible fire at last year's U.S. Nationals in Indianapolis. Well, unfortunately for Whit, in qualifying at the Gators, he flambéed the Permatex Ford Pro one more time. David, I believe he tried to pedal it to get traction, and kaboom. That's when it happened. The fire trailing out from behind the Ford Pro. The tire let go, and he was on a ride. You all right, Whit? Yeah. It's fine, Steve. You now, looking at all the soot inside the car and on your helmet, obviously you were holding your breath for a long time. Uh, yeah, it was. This one had a lot more flame inside uh, than, the, than the fire at Indy, but uh, yeah, I just can't believe that it's bitten us again, but we, uh, we'll get it. Get yourself checked out. Thank you.
That's incredible, just sitting there calmly comparing funny car fires. Tom Hoover had something to talk about at Gainesville as well. The Maple Grove, Minnesota driver had qualified in the number 11 spot and in the final four was racing against John Forbes. That was quite a challenge in itself to handle Forbes, the reigning Winston champion. But Hoover had problems that were far more severe than just racing against the king. His difficulties came when the engine popped and the body flew off the race car. Hoover was able to bring the car to a safe stop. The body suffering the bulk of the damage and, of course, the supercharger. A mighty expensive way to get a little fresh air in a funny car. Besides that, what hurt the most, he was ahead of John Forrest, and he knew it. All right, next up, it was Mark Oswald against Mike Dunn. Oswald in the in and out burger car out of Cincinnati, Ohio. Bill Schultz and Gucci, they were over in the far side running well, as was Mike Dunn in the E.B. Abel Snicker car. They both had a great start. It was a great race. Identical elapsed times, 538 Oswald won it, but he cut down a left rear tire, which inflicted severe body damage. Could he come back? Do we have a body for it? No, we don't. This is a brand new car. We just got it done in time for this race. It's, it's a real shame to, you know, I really want to do it for Jeff and Susan this weekend in In-N-Out Burger. You know, they've been so good to us, and uh, I'm real happy over here. It's just a shame something like this had to happen to their brand new car. People at home might be saying, well, can't you fix it? No, you, just, you couldn't fix the body. The chassis, I'm sure, is just fine. That was Mark's thoughts right after the race. But as soon as he got back to the fifth, he ran into the magical mechanics of Winston Drag Racing. They went to work using pieces off of Tom Hoover's race car that, of course, had been damaged just in the previous run. And they were able to patch this car back together, and he brought it to the starting line to race against John Forbes. Boy, they were there in just a nick of time. The crowd always loving an underdog, the patched up body of Mark Oswald's car. Would it hold together? Forrest blazed the tires. Oswald was long gone and won the Gator Nationals at 537, 258 miles per hour. And half the pit area was celebrating this one. All the hands that worked on that car. They wouldn't let Mark give up. Well, you saw faces like Ed McCulloch and his entire crew. Bernie Federley, his crew chief, was over there. Tom Hoover donating parts of his damaged car. Great job by Mark Oswald and the entire in and out crew. Hey, if you love golf and drag racing, there's no better place to be in early April than the Pinehurst, North Carolina region, Rockingham International Dragway for the Winston Invitational. Bob Gooden, well, he came up against that man, that pesky Daryl Alderman and that Dodge. And I think more than anything else, Bob Gooden really needed a confidence builder. He didn't win the championship in 90, was not having a great early 1991. But at Rockingham, anything can happen, and it did. Alderman was away first, Gooden won the race from behind. The Hoosier Grand gets a little broader with every round here at Rockingham, and that's a car you've needed to beat for a long time. Miracles do happen, Steve. We, I'll tell you, that guy, has, Alderman, has really done a job on us for about a year, and uh, it's about time we won a round. Here's some words you love. Bob Glidden is headed for the final round. That's a swift. Steve, miracles may have happened in the final four, but the dreams came to an end in the final round against W.J. In one of the closest races all year long, nearly identical reaction times, only inches separated the two cars at the finish. A 7.29 for WJ, 7.30 for Glidden. Now, the Wednesday invitation of the fields are compact. They're eight car fields as opposed to 16. At the national event, Lori John beat Kenny Bernstein in round one, the low qualifier Dick LaHaye in round number two, and in the final, it was a young lady from Corpus Christi, Texas, up against the reigning Winston champion for $25,000. The Jolly Rancher Candy's car got a great head start, but boy, the engine problem set in, and Amato streaked to a 501 victory. Lori John's being towed off. Lori, it's hard to lose when you have your heart set on a victory, but in a ball of fire, it makes it even worse. Yeah, well, unfortunately, things go wrong, and like they say, Joe knows drag racing, so <laughs> he's a winner here today. But I feel real happy about our performance this weekend, and I think we're back on the right track. It was an expensive weekend, but we've learned some things, and we've got to if we're going to put in any kind of effort for the World Championship. In Funny Car Eliminator at the Winston Invitationals, the name Al Hoffman crept its way into the final round for the first time in his lengthy career. His wife, Helen, 
working with the crew chief Tom Anderson, got the probe into the final to race John Ford. And this team was so excited about finally tasting some success. We really wanted if Hoffman would be up to the pressure. $25,000. That kind of money to this team, that could mean a new engine. It could mean drums of nitromethane, the kind of parts and pieces they so badly needed to run the tour. It could also mean making the next race, giving them a little spending and traveling money. John Ford was in that air lane, and he was forced to watch as Al Hoffman drove away from the tire-blazing Oldsmobile. The celebration began on the starting line, continued all the way down in front of the huge crowd, and culminated with Hoffman, the winner. This one was for my father. That's all I can say. You know, we've been trying to do this for 25 years, and this one was for my father. <laughs> Again, congratulations to you and a great crew. Okay, the other thing I want to say is thanks an awful lot, Tom Anderson, BDS. Uh, I don't know who uh, where to start. You know, I mean, well, Winston might be a good boy. Right. Well, that's probably the top of the list right now, because I'm going to enjoy their money. I'll tell you that. I think this race car will eat most of it up. It's the way it goes. Yeah, it's going to get some new parts. We've got three motors in a trailer, but I'm going to turn them over and get three new ones now. Look out, this man. Well, not only could he be dangerous, he already is. Al Hoffman may be unfamiliar with the procedures of talking to Steve, but he's going to get more practice before the year's over. Well, the Winston Invitational was all for money. The Southern Nationals outside of Atlanta was for Winston points and, of course, a tremendous purse. And what a crowd, the biggest in the history of the AC Delco Southern Nationals. Now, Bernstein, Amato, and Perdome all came here trying to get some kind of a commanding points lead, but much was decided in round one. In the first round of Top Fuel Eliminator, the number seven qualifier in Atlanta, Lori Johns, raced Frank Bradley. The top seven qualifiers were in the four-second range. 4.99 was Lori Johns' time. She was the defending champion. And out she went. Frank Bradley took the victory at a 5.06. As Corey McLenathan, the Anaheim, California driver, qualified 12th at a 5.05. He raced Gary Ormsby, who had a 496 to be number five. Starter Buster Couch was darn glad that Corey brought along his pretty sister, Pauline McClanahan, who laid a lucky kiss on him. And you know what? It just may have paid off. They were both deep stage. Ormsby would run in the fours in qualifying. Could not hear a 506. Loses to McClanahan, the rookies, 504. Buster was to get more smooches on the starting line. In round number two of Top Fuel, it was Gene Snow, the number eight qualifier against number one, Joe Amato. A 4.892 was a new record, but he needed that 1% backup run to make it stick and pick up the 200 extra points that a national record would give him. That may have been on his mind a bit too much, as he left way too soon, Snow the victor. Well, Joe, there's really uh, no way to sugarcoat it. That's a disaster for you. What can I say, Steve? You know, driver error, you know? The worst part is I shut it off. I might have been able to back the record up, but the minute I saw the red light, you know, my mind went blank. You just, you know, you get so mad at yourself for making a mistake, and then Snow does a big wheel stand. Yeah. It's, you know. Tough, I think, is the word that Joe was looking for. And, of course, Kenny Bernstein has always just a bundle of nerves as he was headed towards the top field final. This was just before the race in his beautiful lounge in his gorgeous trailer. But I'll tell you what, he was wide awake when it came time to race Gene Snow. Final round found Kenny Bernstein with the opportunity to pick up some points on the rest of the field and pick them up he did. He set it down to a 504 victory. Not a bad batting average, three out of five. Not bad at all, but there's so much tough competition out there, and it's, you know, there's what, 13 more to go. It'll get really tough before it's over with because it's those guys are just good. And you see the pressure of this tight competition, a motto red lighting, for instance. Well, it is pressure. I mean, when you've got eight or ten cars capable of running right next to each other all day long, you got to be on your toes up there. I read it last week at Rockingham. I mean, it can happen to any of us, and it's, it's tough. It's a lot of pressure. Well, on the buddy car side of things, the Mark Oswald in and out burger car looking far more spiffy than it did in the final round at Gainesville and running every bit as well. Going into the final four, Oswald had run 537 all day long. But up against John Force, Oswald uncorked one. Hit it right out of the park. Daylighting Force with a 521. That had him on their feet at 273 miles per hour. Oswald, the veteran, would meet in the final Dell Worship. That pesky kid from Southern California, barely out of his teens, 
his hardworking, mostly volunteer crew, his talented tuner, his father, Chuck, the screamer was in the near lane. And if he lives to be 150, Del Worship will never forget this race at Atlanta. Del Worship has become the youngest driver to ever win a funny car title in the National Heart Road Association. Oh, it is unbelievable. This is, this is the greatest day of my life right now. You, you were good on the starting line. You anticipated the light nicely. Everything went well for you. That's, that's great. You know, before the run, Forrest came up and says, he can't do it again. Do what you're doing. This one's yours. Dell and his dad, Chuck, celebrated at Atlanta like a first-time victor should. It will never, ever be this way again. A one-two punch was delivered in the final four of Pro Stock competition as Warren Johnson not only left on Daryl Alderman, which is almost impossible, he also outran him. Watch this. Warren Johnson, wire to wire. Few would accomplish this feat in the season that was 91. A 726 to a 727, 189 to 188. The Johnson crew needed that lift. That moved the Oldsmobile of Johnson into the finals against the Ford of Bob Glidden. Earlier, we had talked about how Glidden's season had not been too good to this point. This, in fact, was the high point of 1991 for the Motorcraft Ford. Glidden was in the near lane, and he got the break. When Johnson and his Oldsmobile left the starting line about a day too early, and Glidden took his first and only 1991 victory. Losing just eats you up, doesn't it? Well, you know, we all win some if we're lucky enough, and, and everyone loses. Uh, we've certainly been in a drought. Losing's not as bad as, as our performance has been. Starting the year out, we ran, uh, you know, worse than we ran three years ago, and I don't think there's any excuse for that. Well, it certainly isn't because you're not all working hard. We know that. No, we worked hard to get that far behind. <laughs> Congratulations. Great job. AC Delco Southern Nationals champ, Bob Glidden. Steve, there was certainly no doubt in anybody's mind that Glidden was successful in getting that far behind, but that big win in Atlanta gave him the impetus to move on to Memphis, Tennessee, where it was time for the Mid-South Nationals. The goodies, TNN Mid-South Nationals for the fourth annual year gathered in Memphis in May. And in round number two, Mr. Johnson uh, got a chance to win back some of his pride after the embarrassment of that Southern National start. You're right, David, it wasn't even a close red light. He wasn't anticipating uh, somewhere something just faded away. But in round number two, it was Glidden and Johnson. Johnson qualified number three. Glidden was qualified number six. And taking no chances on the starting line was Warren Johnson. A nice, safe start. Glidden with an almost perfect light. Johnson had that brute Oldsmobile horsepower. Rusty Glidden could not root his father home on that day. 7.36 to a 7.50. It was a woman. Once again, Darrell Alderman had qualified number one at an NHRA Winston event. And here at Memphis, he brought over a thousand point lead into this race in the Winston Chase. He had the main choice in the final round against Warren Johnson. The advantage off the starting line went to Alderman, but it disappeared quickly as Alderman was doing everything he could to keep the car from crossing the center line. Warren Johnson won the race. Our in-car camera gave us a chance to watch Darrell Alderman fight the wheel. Look at that car move around. He was able to keep it off the center line and the guardrail, but Johnson won. You were all over the racetrack. He got there first. Yeah, he's got my number, Steve. He said he was going to try to turn this around uh, after Gainesville, but uh, maybe you do have his number. Well, I don't know how I got his number. That's just a sign of a good competitor. We're out to beat each other, and Daryl and I are, are good friends, and we're better than that. We're good competitors, I think, and that's really the bottom line. Why well, I agree with that. A parting 734? Well, if we're consistent, but not consistently fast enough. Daryl, what got it all over the racetrack? I really don't know. When I went in second, it moved to the center with me, and I tried to drive it on through, but, you know, that's racing. Great show, you guys. Congratulations, Warren Johnson. Johnson may have Alderman's number, but Alderman's got the big number in the Winston points chase. After Memphis, look at the lead he had. Ekman was third, Glidden fourth, and Jeffrey on number five. John Forrest trucked into Memphis with a 1,200-point lead over Mike Dunn. But in round number one, he didn't do himself any favors. Everything was okay as far as Austin Coyle was concerned, but there was something wrong in the cockpit. It was John Forrest. He was late against Jerry Caminito. 
Watch out the left side. There goes Blue Thunder. Caminito beat him a 549 to a quicker 546. Bush just hates it when that happens. Also in round number one, a funny car eliminator, Tom Hoover was racing Mark Oswald. You remember back at Gainesville and the Gator Nationals, he was back here at the Mid-South Nationals with a vengeance after blowing that body off. He squared off in round one against the top qualifier, Mark Oswald, who also had been in the final round of this race for the previous three years. Oswald up in smoke, Hoover the winner. Well, Mark, after three years in the finals, we thought you owned this place, but apparently it just called the mortgage. Yeah, uh, luck ran out here, Steve. Uh, you know, we sometimes it's hard when your car's running hard to back up a little bit. We we tried to, but uh, racetrack didn't seem, seem to be what it was yesterday. You know, you just can't get too carried away. Uh, Tom's a very tough car, you know. If we got too conservative, he'd just jump up there and whip us anyway. Sorry to see you out. Thank you. Well, in round number two, young Dell Worsham, who won his first championship uh, just two weeks prior to the Southern Nationals, was brought back down to terra firma, even though he had the whole shot. Tom Hoover won it at 548. And after the race, Brock Yates talked to his dad, George. Well, it's like this, you know. Down by the drag strip early in the morning, see the little funny cars all in a row, see Mr. Bustercock press a little button, and the way they go. <laughs> 86 years of age, and no one's having more fun and singing better songs than George Hoover. All Tom Hoover wants to sing about is his big win at Memphis. One thing standing in his way, though, was Mike Dunn at the wheel of the Dodge, tuned by his dad, Jim. Problems for Hoover prevented a strong challenge. Dunn took the victory. 530 at 275 miles an hour. The Snickers crew had lots to celebrate. That big win at Memphis moved Mike Dunn into second behind John Force in the Winston Point standings. Oswald was third, Ed McCulloch fourth, and Jim White was number five at that point in the season. Lori Johns was under tremendous pressure in Memphis. She was the defending champion, yet her crew chief Larry Meyer had announced that he and the entire crew would be leaving the team after this race. So as fate would have it, she cut through the field. Her first real victim was the winner of the last race on the tour, Kenny Bernstein. Take this, Bud King. For the second time in the still early season, it was Lori Johns with Bernstein's number of 513, defeated a tire smoking 547. Moving on to the final four, Lori Johns versus Joe Amato. And why not? Let's ride along with Joe Amato. What do you think, Big Mac? Great idea, Steve. As you can see, a cylinder head gasket ported its way out as Lori Johns, for the second year in a row, beats Joe Amato. Last year, it was in the finals. On the other side of the ladder in the final four, it was Gary Ormsby's Castro special, squared off against Don Prudhomme in the Skull Bandit. And David, sadly, we couldn't know that this was the last pass that Gary Ormsby would make in a top heel dragster in Winston Championship competition. Gary losing with a 5'10 to Don Prudhomme's 5'11. In the finals of Top Fuel, there was one person standing in the way of Lori John's opportunity for a repeat victory, and that was Don Prudhomme at the wheel of the Skull Bandit. Now, off the starting line, it was all Prudhomme. But as you'll see, Lori John's lame duck crew went out in style nonetheless with the second year put her in the winner's circle at 5'07 to 70. Laurie Johns makes it back-to-back -back wins at the Mid-South Nationals. Great job, kid, and I think your confidence had a lot to do with it today. My confidence had everything to do with it. I felt great coming into the race and just as happy as I could be, and I, I really knew that we were going to win this one. I'm a little disappointed that I let him get to me on the starting line because he did, and I was ready to go, and I thought that he had staged, and I realized I looked up and he hadn't, and I was ready to go staring at the light for a long time, and then he went in and I, I got shook, I shook me up. You learn something every time you go to the starting line not to do again. That's very true, and I, I watched the tree before I watched the staging process, and it, it got me messed up, but it doesn't matter because it came out well and we won the event. After the Mid-South Nationals at Memphis, Kenny Bernstein had the lead in the Winston points. Don Prudhomme was second, Amato third, Ormsby fourth, and Frank Hawley rounded out the top five. Still without acquiring a taste for grits, the tour moved out of the South to Middle America. National Trail Raceway outside of Columbus, Ohio, for the Oldsmobile Spring Nationals. And this is one event Kenny Bernstein will not put in his scrapbook. He came here in the points lead, but would see himself slip to third before it was all over and done with. And Laurie Johns, once again, for the third time in 91, 
helped him along with a little bitty nudge. Steve Morey had her new Jolly Rancher Candies crew hard at work. Ron Swearingen and Steve had tuned this car to the number eight qualifying spot. And Kenny Bernstein was qualified ninth, blazed the tires in the first round and the motor as well. Had it not been in competition for his round, you might have lifted it, it been qualifying. Yeah, and I would have lifted, but you know, at the time it started smoking, she wasn't around, and I said, well, I'm not gonna lift now, but I know I'm gonna be in trouble. And I was hoping she was having trouble, but she didn't. She she put it down through there, and that's what counts. Sorry to see you out. Let me tell you something, she's got our number, doesn't she? <laughs> well, that's about three in a row, I think. Don Perdome had a lot to be pensive about, thinking about those Winston points. Bernstein was out, Lori Johns was removed by Joe Amato, Don Perdome had gotten by Frank Ollie, and now it was time. Head to head, Joe Amato against the snake. Looking on from the camera mounted on Joe Amato's wing, it was Tim Richards making the final adjustment on that engine, sitting behind Joe Amato. Perdome knew to stay into contention, he had to beat Amato. Amato knew if he won this race, he would take the Winston points lead after a bad early season. You saw the tire smoke. It was Perdome all the way, 5-0-8. Well, he burned it up to do it, but Don Perdome has just won his first top fuel race in 21 years since the 1970 U.S. Nationals. Who says you can't go home again? Yeah, I guess it's never too late. But right now, I absolutely love it. You know, this cold band in Havlin car just, uh, it was running good, and, uh, you know, a model was a car to beat, but, you know, things were starting to work our way a little bit, too, and I'm just pleased to be in the winner's circle after all we went through. Using that victory as a springboard, Don Prudhomme leapt into the lead. Joe Amato was second, Kenny Bernstein third, Holly fourth, and Lori Johns number five. On the funny car side of things, when we got down to the final four, it was Mike Dunn versus John Forrest. Forrest was getting a little tired of seeing this Snickers car. Dunn was qualified number two. Forrest qualified only number six. A bad couple of races for Forrest, a good couple of races for Mike Dunn. Dunn was knocking on the door, and the knocks became ever more insistent at the Spring Nationals in this funny car final four matchup. We had the advantage of the Diamond Peace Sports camera mounted inside the Castro Oldsmobile. You got the opportunity to see John Force fight this car down the racetrack and watch as Mike Dunn took yet another round victory here in the final four. A great run by Dunn of 537 to advance him to the finals. But in the pits of the number one qualifier, Jim White, a nitro cocktail was being brewed to face Mike Dunn in that final round. For one of the few times, if not the only time in the 91 season, John Forrest now on the outside would be cheering for Jim White. That would be silence later on in the year, as you will see. The lane choice here went to White. He had a 533 in the final four. A very close matchup as Dunn got a very slight advantage off the starting line, but a 534 victory in the Snickers car went to the winner's circle. Your dad used a light hand on this car all weekend. Maybe that's what won it for you. Well, we had a light hand the first round, and then we had a problem with it dropping cylinder the second round. We found a problem in the clutch to where it, uh, we felt that it would help it out in the final. I don't know what it ran. It felt halfway decent, uh, and, and, it, and it helped us. Uh, we didn't want to get too crazy on it. We just obviously wanted to win the race. And you have cut John Force's points lead in half from nine to about 450. Well, that's the best part about it. And it's, it's you know, we've got a long way to go, and anything can happen. And, you know, I just want to thank the crew, my dad, Jim Dunn, uh, Walt, Steve, Sandy, Diane, my wife, Sandy. A great champion, Mike Dunn. He could go all the way this year. After the Spring Nationals, John Forrest had to be concerned because Mike Dunn had moved very close, and Jim White, look where he had come, all the way up to third, Mark Oswald fourth, McCulloch fifth. You know, Dave, one of the more pleasant surprises of the 91 Pro Stock season was Jim Yates. He became a consistent late-round player, and here at Columbus made it to the Final Four before going out against the number one qualifier, Darrell Alderman, 734 to a 737. And that set up a Pro Stock final between, guess who, they're back, Daryl Alderman and Warren Johnson. Do you think this crowd was up for this next race? Steve, the crowd was certainly up, and I have a feeling that Warren Johnson, looking back in retrospect, wished he had turned it up maybe just a little bit more if he could have. He came into this final round as the number three qualifier against the number one qualifier, who else, but Daryl Alderman. That 729 in qualifying held up for low elapsed time of the meet. Alderman also had the quicker reaction time in the final against WJ. Both cars ran identical 733s, and both of them over 188 miles an hour. Alderman the winner.
He just took the edge by one. You guys had met four times. This was the fifth. It's now three to two. Oh, well, I guess somebody's keeping score. I don't know. This is too hard to keep score right now. It's going to be like this all year long. There's no question about that. Well, I, I, I'll go along with the way it's been going. Well, I don't want it exactly like this, but as long as we meet in the final, that's all right with me. <laughs> a great champion and a great runner-up. Thank you, guys. From Ohio, the national event trail moved uh, to the only international event on the series, and that is Montreal, Canada, the race at San Air, and the weather, Steve, was absolutely gorgeous at the Le Grand National Molson. And I'll tell you what, at this track, they parley vu pro stock. They were looking forward to seeing Daryl Alleman, Warren Johnson, and Bob Button, and they got their shot. Now, in the pro stock final four, it was Glidden against Johnson, the two old warriors. And don't you know, Glidden still had designs on making his present belt on the pro stock field in 1991. He ran very well in eliminations, including this one against Warren Johnson. It was Glidden away first by two hundredths of a second. And it's a good thing they ran identical 7.26 of last time. I talked to Bob. I tell you, you and WJ just never disappoint. What a drag race. 7.26 for both of you. That was a good race. Uh, I'm, I'm glad we're going into the final. I think I saw a 7-2-3 on the board in front of me about the Dodge. So. Yeah, that was not an illusion. Going to be a tough one, but that's the way it goes. Leave on him. We'll try. You know how old men are. <laughs> hey, I take umbrage to that. Hey, I'm older than both of you. Don't worry about it. Daryl Alderman had lots to worry about, though. He only got one qualifying pass at Montreal. That was because he was delayed by bad weather, was unable to make it for the first three sessions, made only the last shot, and qualified in the 13th spot. In the final round, it was truly a great race. A starting line advantage by Alderman and a close race by Glidden made the crowd stand up and cheer. Well, there is your pro stock champion, Daryl Alderman. What a great drag race, the quickest elapsed time of the event at 7.20. Yeah, uh, you know, we're really tickled with the performance here this weekend. You know, not getting to run, but one qualifying session. And, uh, you know, the boys just really tuned the car up, and it went great all day long. And to beat Glidden, the 10-time champ, is always a thrill. Oh, definitely. I, I don't think there's a pro stock driver out there that don't like to beat Bob Glidden. Congratulations, champ. Thank you. Alderman's Canadian victory moved him even further ahead of Warren Johnson, who went out in the final four. Jerry Ekman's third, Bob Glidden was fourth, and Scott Jeffrey on number five in the Winston Points chase. Well, the top fuel contingent came to Montreal with a three-horse race. Bernstein, Perdome, and Amato. If Amato, Tim Richards hoped, were to beat Perdome, Amato would take the points lead. If not, Kenny Bernstein would take second, and Amato would drop to third. There were so many variables as we went into the final four, which saw Perdome and Amato again head to head. The snake over in the far lane, a dead even start by both drivers. Amato with traction problems, the snake streaks by 502, 272. Kenny Bernstein also made it through the final four, even though he had to change an engine out of round number two. And Dave Wynn, Bernstein and Perdome started those cars and headed for the starting line. I just thought as my perch down the bar it, this could be one of the classic races of the season. It certainly was. The only four-time Winston champions in Tony Carl Eliminator now in Tom Fuel meeting up in the finals in Canada. Slight advantage for Bernstein and the win. Not bad for two old funny car guys. Couldn't hit their back ends last year. Oh, that's the truth. Now, we'd have to check with the guys in the tower, but uh, you might have taken the 50 points away from the snake with that 0-2. We'll have to check the 1,000th digit. Well, it's gone a long season to go for that Winston Championship. It's going to take a lot to get there. This is just one race. We got, what, 11 more of these things to go? Yeah, but you've won four of them. You just got to quit going out in the first round of the ones you lose. Those 50 points did end up in Bernstein's camp, but Prudhomme kept the lead. Amato third, Hawley fourth, Lori Johns number five. Almost to the midpoint of the season, John Force had been fire-free. But unfortunately, in Montreal, one of Force's favorite venues, he lit it up one more time, qualifying alongside Mike Dunn. Put yourself in that Castro Oldsmobile. The window in the firewall showing the flame that was billowing out from the front fender wells. Quite a ride for John Force. Austin Coyle checking with John Force. First of all, John's okay. They've cooled him off with some water. And John, everyone at home knew, as you did, when those windows in the firewall lit up, you were in big trouble again. <laughs> we're back. <laughs> what can I say? Uh, that was strange. Uh, gave no warning. Uh, motor was trucking and uh, just, uh, 
again, we did what we had to do with the race car, trying to run Lloyd T. I don't even know what she run, but it was it was a queer deal. She never lights up like that on me. And uh, can it be fixed? Or you need a new body. We, this team, the attack team, can fix anything. If we got spare bodies. We got spare everything. We'll just have to fix it. Kind of amazing, though, huh? Kind of amazing is right. The attack team he refers to as his crew, headed up by none other than Austin Coyle. They repaired the car, put it all the way into the final four, where he raced against Mike Dunn and won. That moved John Force into the final round against Jim White. And this was the first taste of Jim White that John Force got personally. The Roland Leon car, tuned by Wes Cerny, was slowly but surely making performance in roads. The Montreal track wouldn't allow them to run that quick, only a 5.59, but that's all they needed over a tire smoking John Forrest. Anytime you can beat the world champ, champ, you did good. And he's been your victim in both your national event wins so far. I know, and last year, it's uh, it seems to be fair because last year he beat me six or seven times in a row. I was zero for seven last year, so, you know, it, it ought to come back around. Come back around, it did. It kept White in third. John Force continued to lead after Montreal. Mike Dunn was second. Oswald in the fourth spot. And number five was Ed McCullough. But it was at Montreal our wonderful summer weather would end, for a short time anyway, when we got to Old Bridge Township Raceway Park for the Mopar Part Summer Nationals. Well, let's say it was just a bit inclement. In fact, rain plague race weekend and the final eliminations were pushed until late at night. Steve, it was at English Town that the STT Pontiac of Ricky Smith made its presence felt in the Winston Points chase. He came up to challenge the big boys, and in round number two, one of the biggest of them all, Warren Johnson, felt the sting of Tricky Ricky on the starting line. Noted for his reaction time, Ricky made it pay off for him at English Town. There by four hundredths of a second was the advantage gained by Ricky Smith. The Pontiac power pulled him through to victory and advanced him into the final four. We ain't qualified the last two races. You know, we've had some, we've been struggling so hard. And to come back and qualify and be in the finals, it just don't, it can't get no better than this. I want to win the race, but I mean right here, this is it. And that was indeed as good as it would get. In the final round, it was Ricky Smith again with an incredible 4-2 light, except Daryl Alderman mowed the tree down with a 4-0 light when he needed it. A 7-29 Alderman again in the winner's circle. For Ricky Smith, though, it was the finest day he had had throughout the 91 season, and the two of them congratulated each other at the other end for a great show. Dave, you remember it was at Houston. We talked about Richard Hartman and the problems that he had at that event. Well, believe it or not, here at English Town, they even got worse. The car owner, Nick Bonanfante Sr., handling the tune-up on this race car as they, in round number one, matched up against Dominic Santucci. Watch the Ravesta Souls in the far lane. You won't believe your eyes. The highest wheel stand I have ever seen by a funny car. As it came back to earth, it collapsed the fuel tank. That's where the flames came from. Richard Hartman got it stopped, and the good news is he was okay. Richard, when did you first know you had big problems? Uh, when I lifted it, the front end didn't come down. The next thing I knew, the body was coming off. I knew I was in trouble. What unlatched the body? Apparently, just the air got underneath it, and it it kind of just like a drag shirt just tried to take the body right off the chassis and it, it did a good job of that and then when it came down the a-arms broke and i could i had no control over it the most important thing is you're all right yeah that's all right john force can read national director he knew that mike dunn was getting close in the points chase so in round number two at the summer nationals he let the challenge go no further it was force at a 5 31. Oh, I've been hearing all weeks about that Snickers car. I'm just kind of fed up with it. And, and I kind of like, I stay kind of humble here at the end, but like they have been whipping up on us for a while. And I told Coyle, give me some help. My lights stink. I don't know what happened. What happened on the lights? Anything? You were a little bit late. Late, late as usual. I seen a whole bunch of Snickers car, but old Coyle here earned his money, he paid it off. So all I can say is uh, sorry for them. Thank God for us. Did he call himself humble? Humility is not his strong suit, Steve. Of course, that's what makes him what he is. John Force, the Winston champion. In the final four, it was Force against Mark Oswald. And that's where the day for John ended with an exploded engine right out of the burnout box. Oswald went on to the final round. 
On the other side of the ladder, it was the number one qualifier at one of the quickest times ever. A 5.18 for Jim White. He had to face the youngster Del Worsham. Jim White was slowed by mechanical problems just past the midway point, and Del Worsham was into the final round for the second time in his short career. And it was the same scenario as the last time Worsham was to meet Oswald. Oswald appeared to have the stronger car, and they were knee-deep in the grease in the Del Worsham pit. But once they came to the starting line, after dark, all oh, the fans love the flames here at Raceway Park in New Jersey. It was Del Worsham, second off the mark, but first to the finish line with a tremendous 5.29 at 2.73. Oh, this is unbelievable. I seen the headers and the sparks. I pulled the fire bottles and I was ready to come out the top. And my dad, Ron, Paul, the rest of the crew, Nikki Bonifani, they did an unbelievable job. Have you ever even driven a funny car at night? Just here this weekend, whatever I did here this weekend. Again, tremendous job. You know, you work in the shadow of all those big rigs out of your little bitty trailer, but you humbled them on this day. Oh, yeah, we can't afford the big rigs, but we get ourselves some decent parts. Those decent parts gave him his second victory. In Top Fuel Eliminator, again, Lori Johns and Kenny Bernstein. Bernstein is a man who also has some decent parts, but he can't seem to get past Lori Johns no matter where they race. This time, it's in round number one. Corey Johns and the Jolly Rancher Candy's car advanced. Kenny Bernstein somehow musters a smile. I can't believe it. How long can this go on? I'm telling you, Steve, it's a six to two now, and every time we run it, we either smoke the tires or red light. Uh, they did the job, and we didn't again, and uh, we're disappointed, but I, I don't, it's kind of gotten past the stage of, of being mad. It's getting comical now. Well, Lori Johns was headed for the final. And when she got there, she would meet Tom McEwen. But there's more to the story. Tom McEwen's crew chief for the very first time at English Town was Larry Meyer, formerly of the Laurie Johns operation. He won the last time he raced with Laurie. What would happen on this night in New Jersey? A late afternoon thunderstorm had delayed the final round into total darkness. And Laurie Johns up in smoke. But Tom McEwen, after an identical reaction time to Johns, streaked to a five-flat, 283-mile-an-hour victory, his first ever in a top fuel dragster. And it was the M&M boys, Meyer and McEwen, celebrating their Mobile One win. And for car owner Jack Clark, this was a grand slam home run. The high country of Colorado, the next venue for the NHRA Winston Championship Trail. And Julie Clark put on a spectacular aerial exhibition before the running of the Mopar Parts Mile High Nationals at Vandermeer Speedway near Denver, Colorado. Fresh off that runner-up finish at English Town, Lori Johns and her crew chief Ron Swearingen came to the high country at Vandermeer and ran the only four-second time at mile high altitude of 499 to qualify number one. And in round two, Laurie was to meet Tommy Johnson Jr. Doesn't run a lot of big races, but when he does, he always brings his power, and he would need it. Now, she ran her four at night during qualifying. Race day was another set of circumstances. A tremendous side-by-side -side race. Johnson Jr. wins it by one hundredth of a second. I haven't been on today. I've had a terrible time driving the car. I don't know what my problem is, and, you know, they're really not as much at fault as I am. I, I should have been better off the line. I was going to deep stage, and for some reason, I didn't turn the light out when I thought I, I, I was going to, and I, I got distracted, and he left, and I was still sitting there. That was not a typical Lori Johns reaction time. We all knew that. Yeah, I, I don't know what my problem is. Lori Johns was laid off the starting line in some seven hundredths of a second to P.J. Jr., getting some consolation from her crew chief, Ron Swearingen. Tommy Johnson advanced then to the final four where he raced Don Prudhomme, who spit a blower belt off just past the halfway mark. Johnson won. Now you have dreams about going into a final round. How's it feel? Boy, this is nice. At Denver, I've been in the final here twice and lost them both. I'm going to try not to let that happen again. All right, turn it around. I'll try to, Steve. Thanks. Johnson formerly raced in alcohol funny car. In the final round, it was to be the youngster, Tommy Johnson Jr., against the king of the hill, none other than Joe Amato. He had won for the last three years here at Denver, gunning to make it number four. The advantage off the starting line went to Tommy Johnson Jr., but the horsepower was riding with Amato, and he took his fourth mile-high Nationals title.
Uh, we very well could have been out of this race in the first round. He pedaled it, and uh, we, we should have been out of the race in the first round, and that was really the driver. Maybe in the last round, that was the crew and the crew chief. But uh, it's, it's everybody working together. It's a team effort, and that's just what it takes. There's no other way to be consistent. That goes from the driver right down to the guy that cleans the tires off. That consistency was beginning to show for Joe Amato as he moved into second behind Don Prudhomme in the Winston points chase. It was close at this point with Bernstein third, Hawley fourth, Laurie Johns fifth. During pro stock competition, Scott Jeffrey on the Warren Johnson protege and the team car took care of Daryl Alderman. Warren Johnson en route to the final round took care of Bob Glidden. So it was all Johnson as far as car ownership was concerned. But they both maintained they were going to go to the starting line and race for it. The kid Jeffrey on from Huntington Beach, California, welded Johnson on the starting line. Could the boss come back? You bet he could. The boss moved a bit closer to Alderman, but not much. Glidden in third, Jeffrey on fourth, and Jerry Ekman now number five after the Mile High Nationals in Denver. Mike Dunn made the finals at the Mile High Nationals, but his thoughts were with the memory of Joe Paisano who passed away from a heart attack in the pits during qualifying. Joe Paisano was pure racer and a friend to everyone in this sport. Joe P, as we all called him, and Mike Dunn had their greatest success at the 1986 U.S. Nationals, beating Billy Meyer in a Kenny Bernstein body funny car in that final round. Joe will indeed be missed. I think most people thought that Joe P was kind of a gruff guy. He rarely smiled on the outside, even when he won. But our Diamond P cameras were on hand to catch a very tender moment at the 1989 Keystone Nationals as he consoled a losing Mike Dunn. In the finals at the Mile High Nationals at Funny Car Eliminator, Mike Dunn tangled with Ed McCullough. And the frustration was starting to show in McCullough. He had not won a race all year. He would not win the mile highs. A foul start, a red light, the ace left too soon. Dunn won it at 547. We lost Joe Paisano this week, and uh, uh, he, he was pretty close to me. And, and I don't know, I, I just feel like he was with me today because I, I was driving him driving pretty good. And, uh, you know, I just like to think that maybe this was his last ride. And, no matter what can be said about him or, or whatever, uh, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you guys if it, if it wasn't for Joe Paisano, and I'm going to miss him. Well said. He was with all of us today. From Denver, Colorado, the national event trail moves west. Three consecutive races on three consecutive weekends. It's tough. In the middle, the Autolite California Nationals at Sears Point near Sonoma, California. Buckle up, everybody. You're about to go for a ride. We've never wanted to know what would happen if a top fuel engine hydraulic right near the finish line. Unfortunately, in qualifying, Jack Ostrander found out. When the engine blew, it took a tire and the wing with it. The rest is frightening. The engine on fire came around in front of Ostrander, causing some burns to Jack. The car itself nosed into that right-hand guardrail slapped it again very hard. Then with the fire billowing back over the cockpit, Ostrander was nothing but a passenger and a ball of flame. As we look at the incident again from another angle, you can see exactly what happened. The engine let go, there went the tire, the wing falls off, out comes the flame. Now Ostrander can do nothing but just hold on and pray. A tremendous impact with the guardrail broke the car in half. After Ostrander was taken from the wreckage by the NHRA safety safari, through the life flight helicopter, he was taken to the hospital. He stayed overnight, was checked out, and released the next day. And as you'll see later on in this tape, returned to the drag racing wars in Dallas. Absolutely amazing. In round one at the California Nationals, Don Perdome leading the Winston points based off with Russ Collins. What an inopportune time to lose traction to an ailing opponent. It just things that happened, you know. We're, we're racing number 16 car, and and uh, we smoked the tires, and I'd have got back with it, but it, it shook me so bad by the time I got my vision and stuff and found out where I was at, it it was just too late. And, of course, I guess he had trouble to shut off or something. It's just, just the way the mop flops. The mop flopped badly for Joe Amato. Tim Richards and crew were really pressured. 
just a 45-minute time span before the start of eliminations, the engine had problems on the jack stands in the pit. They had to change everything in it and yet made the first round. Just how big a question mark are you taking to the starting line here? Well, I have 100% confidence in my crew. I think they'll do a good job, and uh, all I can do is say it's 100% and go and try and win the race. The clutch might be the biggest question mark. Yeah, the, well, the clutch is brand new. All the fuel pumps are brand new. The blower, I mean, everything on the car, it's like a brand new race car. We're going first round without starting it. Good luck to you. Thank you. We'll need it. Maurice Dupont was Amato's first round opponent. The question was, first, would the engine start? Second, how good would it run? Well, it was the first four-second run of eliminations, a 496. Oh, well, certainly it was a nightmare, but I caused it by myself by being forgetful. But my guys, I mean, what can I say? They are as good as they come. A four-second run, a gift from heaven at this point. You better believe it. <laughs> Joe Amato went on to change motors two more times, but yet he ended up in the winner's circle and took the points lead over Don Brudeau. Bernstein was third, John's fourth, Frank Hawley number five. Well, the fans at Sonoma, I'm sure after watching all of the Diamond Peak telecasts, wanted to see a long, smoky John Forrest burnout, and they got the best he had to offer. And they got a classic final round confrontation, Forrest against McCullough, the number one and two funny cars in the world. The race itself, well, was maybe a little bit disappointing, as McCullough had huge problems, and Forrest went on to win and earned more wins than points. But they've done it without Austin Cole, and these guys are unbelievable. Uh... The car had unbelievable horsepower. It got stronger every round. That's what we've been searching for. And, and yeah, I got the driver. She was just like an old truck out there in oil. She was all over. And uh, it was a great race. Ed McCall is a great man, and all these guys are. And I'm just very proud to be part of it. See you in Seattle next Sunday. And we're still hanging on to that lead, gang. The Winston points chase in Funny Car, not quite as tight as it was in Top Fuel. Force was the leader. Mike Dunn second. Jim White third, Ed McCulloch was in fourth, and after the California Nationals, Mark Oswald held down number five. The crew for the Mopar Parts Dodge Daytona had a hard time getting this car to hook up on the Sears Point racetrack, but that's why you hire a big gun like Daryl Alderman to drive. And on this day, did Alderman ever earn his money up against Larry Morgan in the final round? Alderman, six hundreds of a second off the starting line advantage, and he won it, 7.30. We got out on him in low and second, and it went to moving around a little bit with me. And in high gear, the Oldsmobile come, you know, started walking on me at the very end there, and I really didn't even know who won. The Western Tour moves to Seattle next Sunday. That's a good racetrack. This car might like it. Yeah, I'll be glad to, you know, get to a track where the little Dodge will hook up in low and second. At the end of the California Nationals, Darrell Alderman was practically unstoppable in the Winston Point chase. WJ was second, Glidden third, Jeffrey on fourth, and Ekman in the number five slot. The bluest guys you've ever seen are in Seattle, and they're even more exciting when the Blue Angels come thundering into the Jolly Rancher Candies Northwest Nationals. With Mount Rainier as a backdrop, Seattle International Raceway was one of the most pleasant events of the year and one of the most exciting. It was an exciting weekend for Jim White. He had a tenth of a second advantage on the field. We just feel like if it'll just do what it's supposed to do, everything's going to be just fine. But today, uh, just been running flawlessly. Right now, we've got a bit of a problem, but I got the guys that can fix it. It is raining oil off of the back of the car, and I'm sure that's what you're talking about. How serious do you think it is? Well, there's no rods out of it, but it is a little bit damp. We'll, we've got some work to do. Okay, we'll let you get at it. The Seattle race was one that uh, kind of went into the record book for Jim White as proving he could run with the big boys, and we mean guys like John Force, because that's who he met in the final. And John Force was starting to realize with Wes Cerny on that team, they had some equipment and some speed tickets maybe he didn't have. So what did he do? Pummel him on the starting line. Force, a fantastic 4 7 reaction time, wins it. John Forrest, that was one terrific side-by-side -side race with Jim White. Hey, when you're racing that old punch bowl, boy, you got to give her all you got. But I got to say, this old coil-tuned heap and this crew, she made her work. Uh, out in the middle, I guess we all did our jobs. What a weekend, huh? In two weeks, Brainerd, more points available, more on the table. Got a match race in Boise and a few days off on the river. We'll be ready for Brainerd. We're hungry. Does John Forrest ever have a full plate? Well, he certainly did after Seattle in the Winston points chase as he extended his lead over Mike Dunn. Jim White had moved to third, Ed McCulloch fourth, and Mark Oswald stayed fifth. With Don Perdome losing first round at Sonoma and Joe Amato winning the race, 
Amato took the Winston top fuel points lead, and the Snake took a further blow to his hopes of a championship with a round one loss in Seattle, coming at the hands of Cruz Pedregon. Pedregon had a slight advantage off the starting line. Few have done that against Perdome in 91, and actually outran him a 502 to a 503. It was at Seattle that it became apparent that Gary Ormsby would not return to the driver's seat. At this race, he turned over the controls of the Castro Special to Gordy Bonin, who ran his first ever four. Handpicked by Gary to finish out the season in this car is six-time Funny Car event winner Gordy Bonin. His first time down the racetrack put this car right into the fours where it belongs. What a ride. What a ride, Steve. I, I tell you, stepping on the gas, I knew, boy, hang on, and then it was just like it was over. I mean, I, I, it was the quickest ride of my life, no question. And you'd been out of the seat a while. Two years, two years, and I said, yeah, I'll probably be a little rusty, but uh, I mean, this Castro crew and this team, they're a machine. No one has more inspiration to win the day than you do. Not at all. I mean, we're doing this whole thing for Gary. He could have parked this. We're here, we want to take that trophy back to Gary on Tuesday. But Joe Amato was to stand in their way. He, Tim Richards, and the crew meant to dominate the last race of the Western Swing. Of course, they won on the mountain in Denver, pulled out that mechanical miracle at Sonoma, and desperately wanted the hat trick to pad that points lead. This was the final four. Bonin off the mark first, Amato with a power, 496, 283. On the other side of the ladder, Tom McEwen had put away the number three man in the Winston points, Jace Kenny Bernstein in the second round. Then in the final four, he beat up on Cruz Pedragon, but in the finals, he left before the tree was even activated. Took a shot at Joe Amato, it did not pay off, and Amato had his hat trick. Well, something that did pay off for pro stock driver Warren Johnson was again that second car with Scott Jeffrey on in it. In the pro stock final four, the two got together for the second time this year. Qualified number one was Johnson at a 724. Jeffrey on again, though, would get off of the starting line first. I don't know if that's good job security or not. But Jeffreyon's power was no match for that of Warren Johnson in the prime car, a 724 to a 734, but that sent Johnson to the final. On the other side of the eliminations ladder, one driver had a chance for some revenge, and he took his measure of it. Larry Morgan in the Castro Lowe's full bill, loser to Darrell Alderman's whole shot just a week earlier at Sears Point, put one of his own on Alderman in the Dodge, but it was only a hundredth of a second, not near enough. When Darrell Alderman ran a 7.29 at over 188 miles an hour to move to the finals of the Northwest Nationals, where once again his opponent would be Warren Johnson. Yeah, and we lost lane choice there, and uh, the boys are just going to have to tune it up a little bit for this final round. Uh, you know, uh, both lanes are good here. Uh, we just need to get the right combination on the clutch and get through the gears and not spin or shake. Well, Alderman did all of the above and more, including Levon Johnson. But on this day in the Jet City, he did not have all that it took to beat a more powerful automobile. Warren Johnson won it. Well, my friend, you did something today that few have done all year to that dominant Dodge. You just flat out powered it. I'll tell you, that is a, a statement there. I mean, th those guys are tough. Not only Daryl, the whole Wayne County group uh, really uh, deserves a, a round of applause. Uh, our guys are no slouches either by any stretch of the imagination, but I'll tell you, it's rough beating those guys. Well, Warren Johnson kept whittling away at Daryl Alderman's Winston points lead. Bob Blitton stayed third, Scott Jeffrey on fourth, and Ekman remained in the fifth slot. The tour took a much needed week off after Seattle before heading to the land of 10,000 lakes. Brainerd International Raceway, Brainerd, Minnesota, the Quaker State North Star Nationals. And I, I really don't think that Richard Hartman's car is haunted, Dave McClellan, but there's something going on there I wouldn't like if I was him. Steve, I think this is one race he would have wished that there were three weeks off and he just didn't have to go. In the far lane, Richard Hartman had problems. You could see the fire coming out from underneath the car. He got the parachutes out and was on the fire bottles, but had a wild ride. Richard, that was an incredible job of driving to get the thing stopped so you could get help. Yeah, I was trying to get the car stopped. I don't know what happened. It just it was going long, decent, and I think it had a cylinder out when I picked it up. Maybe I hydraulic it and uh, 
blew up, caught on fire, and I got on the bottle as quick as I could. And got the bottles knocked it down, and then it came back on you. Yeah, it came back pretty strong, too, because it was inside the cockpit real good, and I just tried to get stopped and get out of it, and then the seatbelts got hung up. I couldn't get to them real quick. And Other than uh, that, everything was fine. Yeah, other than that, it's fine. But you are fine. Yeah, I'm all right. I don't think the car is all that badly damaged, either. Buzz, Richard, I'd borrow some lucky charms from Joe Amato. Lord knows he's overstocked. Jack Wyatt's another funny car racer that wished he had had a four-leaf clover on that day. Into the guardrail. The car then burst into flames into the other guardrail. And Wyatt had his hands full getting the car stopped and the emergency hatch open. Jack, an awful lot happened in just a few tenths of a second, beginning with, what, a blown engine? I would assume that's uh, probably what happened. It broke a rod, and then I got in the oil, and it came around on me pretty quick. And it's typical. When they hit one wall, the body uh, moves over, opens the throttle, and you hit the other one. We've seen it before. But, uh, once it hits that wall, you're kind of skating around in the oil and stuff. You really don't have much control. I was more concerned trying to keep out of Ed's way and just try to get the fire bottles on and get stopped. Other than a little singe, are you all right? Yeah, just fine. Yeah, just a little bit brokenhearted, really. Hope to see you soon under better conditions. I hope so. We're going to see, you know, take an inventory and stuff, and we'll see. The final round at Brainerd in Funny Car Racing found John Force racing Mark Oswald. Oswald had qualified third, Force in the number five spot, and Oswald was very competitive at this race. John Force may tease a lot about a lot of teams, not this one. The man who wrenches that car, Bill Schultz, formerly worked for Force. He knows how good he is, and everybody knows how good Mark Oswald is. Absolutely unflappable in a funny car. I don't care what happens. Mark Oswald will drive it to its knees. Oswald gained almost four hundredths of a second at the starting line, but Force got it back and won by inches. John Force, three in a row. Congratulations. A great win here in Minnesota. We're excited, Steve. It's a chance maybe to win another world championship, and we just kind of keep trying to push that lead out there. In the days, some of the bad guys fell, and it's just uh, it's just fate there. You made good money today, the big money at the U.S. Nationals Labor Day weekend, and you're hot. Yeah, but you got to hand it. Old McCullough's won that about 100 times, and uh, we'll go down there and just do our best. And right now, uh, we're not chasing money. We're chasing points. Celebrate. Thank you. In top fuel, it came down to another man who had won three in a row, Joe Amato, who has an intense sense of history. Yeah, we'd be the first person in the history of drag racing to win a top fuel class four national events in a row. I mean, uh, there's a lot of guys have tried and they've always got the three and they fumbled. And we really have a lot of pressure to do it. Plus, we've run four times. We're trying to win our fourth world championship. We've run 54 second runs. We've won this race three times. So if we win it again, it'll be the fourth time. I mean, that's a lot of fours. And I guess when he wears those trick driving glasses, he could have four eyes. His opponent was having problems. Kenny said at the other, and there's something wrong with chasing it. Well, yeah, we're, we're still uh, fooling around in the clutch area and trying to make the thing consistent. And that last run, we had to make a move. Uh, we got ourselves backed into a corner with uh, used clutch discs compared to what we wanted to run. And, and we're sort of in that same situation again now, except we have more information. So we're going to try and adjust to it better this time. Bernstein had actually out-qualified Amato at Brainerd. In the number three spot, Amato was fourth, separated by only a hundredth of a second. And in the final round, maybe Amato's trick driving glasses fogged over because he gave up a whole shot to Bernstein that carried him all the way to the winner's circle. Bernstein's time, a 5.05. A lot of good things have happened today. You moved into second in the points. You picked up 200 just now on Joe for the Winston Championship. Well, at least it's not over with. I think if he'd won here, it'd have been pretty much over with. At least there's a taste of an outside shot. But at least, you know, we give him a little battle today in the Budweiser King Quaker State. Mac, two legal snacks is back. <laughs> well, that's good news. I'm relieved to hear that. That's four wins this year for Kenny Bernstein. And those four victories have kept him close to a motto in the Winston Chase. Bredome's third, Hawley in fourth, and Laurie Johns in number five. We haven't talked much about Bruce Allen and Pro Stock and the Raren Morris and Chevrolet. Well, that's because he hadn't been a winner since this race a year ago. And guess what? 1991, Brainerd again in the final round. And the competition was to be the hottest car in Pro Stock racing. That dodge of Daryl Alderman once again came from his number two qualified spot to race against Allen, who had finished in the number four position. Allen loves this racetrack, and it was never more evident than on this day in 1991 because he put a whole shot on Alderman by a hundredth of a second. Then the mechanical gremlins that had plagued the Super Shops team all year long set in once again 
and Alderman won the race with a 732 at 187 miles an hour. Just a week and a half after Brainerd, the tour moved to the biggest of them all, the U.S. Nationals at Indianapolis Raceway Park. Just as this race was getting underway on Wednesday, word came from California. The top fuel champion, Gary Ormsby, had succumbed to cancer. Immediately, it became apparent to all that this U.S. Nationals in 1991 would be something special. In fact, it was dedicated to the memory of Gary Ormsby. Since the early 80s, when Gary and his crew chief, Lee Beard, first began to make their mark in the top fuel ranks, Gary had been respected and admired by racers and fans alike. The 1989 season, despite two devastating crashes, was the pinnacle of Gary's racing career. He won the Winston Top Fuel Championship, culminating a season-long battle with Joe Amato. A very private person, Gary confided the facts of his illness only to his longtime girlfriend, Susie Hoops, whose quiet strength was there for Gary until the end. Drag racing has lost a champion. The team has lost a leader. And we have lost a friend. After the Northwest Nationals, Walt Austin and family had bought all the assets of Gary Ormsby Racing, and this was the very first Top Fuel event for Pat Austin. Well, in Top Fuel Racing, Pat Austin is batting 1,000. You've won your first ever round. Good job. Thanks. Uh, overcoming that open, opening ceremony is the toughest thing I've ever done in my life. Uh, 5.07, great elapsed time from a great car. Yeah, that's great. Uh, that's a good stepping stone, I think. In this round two race, with 40 alcohol funny car titles under his belt, Austin began to prove why he might be one of the great new top fuel drivers. Pat's whole shot, 505, to beat at Hills much quicker, 498. An emotional Lee Beard talked to Don Garland. Lee, I'll tell you, considering the trauma that you've been through, your performance is outstanding. Well, Don, as you know, it's very emotional times for me here. I'm trying to do the best job I can. It's it's very, very difficult. You have no idea how this has affected me, and I have a good team, and they're doing most of the work and allowing me to make the minor decisions that are making our car perform today. We're all with you, Lee. Thank you. In the final four, Lee Beard tuned the car of Pat Austin to race against Tom McEwen. McEwen had qualified seventh, and he had his hands full as Jack Clark, the car owner, reflecting possibly the emotion of the moment, not only for Lee Beard, but also for everyone racing at the U.S. Nationals this year. I'll tell you what, Dave, nobody really wanted to beat that green and white car, but they're racers and you do what you must. No one would beat Pat in this round. Pat Austin, his debut as a top fuel driver, you just threw out Jack Clark's car at third base with a 5.03. This is, a, this is a story that's going to continue for one more round this fuel car, and we're going to get in the winner's circle. Your reaction times are sensational. Everybody's talking about them. They can't even believe them. Well, they're obvious to, it's just like a fight. It's obvious to a boxing match. You go in there, and you establish your ground rules right away, and that's to let them know that you're there for business and nothing else. So I think you like to throw the right hook and hit them on the chin and let them know that you can throw a good hook. Well, you got them on the mat so far. One more round to go. Rock and roll. That's youth showing for you. Rock and roll, what a phrase, and that's exactly what he was doing. Good? Felt good, man. Good job. I believe this car just keeps running better and better, and uh, Pat is a natural in it, apparently. Oh, he's doing a super job. He's like the Airtron Santa of drag racing, you know. <laughs> I'm uh, awful lucky to be in this position to have such a good driver here at the U.S. Nationals. And I think you'll even be more impressed when you see that reaction time. Oh, we've been watching him all through qualifying and eliminations here. He's phenomenal. Lee Beard, of course, referring to Ayrton Senna, who is the great Formula One driver. But elsewhere in top fuel eliminations, there were points to think about. In round two, the top two in the Winston standings met head to head. Kenny Bernstein with that whole shot victory over a motto just a week and a half earlier at Brainerd, Minnesota, getting psyched up to try to do it again. A motto was the number one qualifier at 495. Bernstein only number eight at 506. But when the two met, the reaction time went again to Bernstein. Did he have the performance to again take the measure of Amato? Yes, he did at 5.05. They're the great team out here right now. We all shoot for them. 
to help your championship hopes, you had to get a motto in an early round, dispose of him, you've done that. You didn't really want to. <laughs> You're right related to the final, but if you had to, this is the only hope we've got. Otherwise, he's going to walk away with it. But we're happy right now, and we got some work to do now. Great job. While Bernstein was ecstatic with the victory, Amato felt the pressure. Well, Joe, you and Kenny are great friends, but fierce competitors. That hurt. Well, you know, Steve, we were running good. You know, I just, I, I messed up. I overstayed. I had to back up and it threw my concentration off a little bit. And, uh, you know, he's going to be right there. And the car fell off to a 510 a little bit. But, you know, I got to get all the credit over here for not being aggressive on the line, I guess. You know, I was aggressive, but I just wasn't, you know, didn't get it the light. What can I say? Thanks, Jeff. We'll make a championship out of it anyway. That championship he referred to, of course, would be his fourth Winston title. Pat Austin not only had to confront the emotions of the moment on the Gary Ormsby story, he was also trying to do something that no other driver had ever accomplished in the history of drag racing, win two national event titles on the same day. He was competing both in top fuel and in alcohol funny car. And you have no idea how difficult that is to do. Austin met Tony Bertone in the alcohol funny car final. Imagine now, this is a clutch car, not a centrifugal machine like the Drake. So you've got to shift gears. A lot of things have to be done, and Austin did them all perfectly to a 601-233 victory. There was very little celebration at the far end with Pat Austin. He had his mind on winning top fuel for Gary Armsby into a golf cart in front of the fans, cheering wildly, as you remember, Dave McClellan. He strapped himself into the race car with Gary Ormsby's name on the windshield to honor his fallen friend. Gary's name appeared on the cowl of all the top fuel dragsters this weekend in Indianapolis. The engines came to life, the signal for Pat Austin to approach the water box, and it was at that moment that the bubble burst. The supercharger exploded as he came out of the water, and that brought an end to the day of Pat Austin. You saw the crew man, you saw starter Buster Couch throw down their towels, indicating what a disappointment it was for everyone. Lee Beard hiding the emotions as best he could. Pat Austin came out of the car, over the guardrail, knowing his chance was gone. The throttle response on these fuel cars are just a little more sensitive than an alcohol car, wouldn't you say? It's, it's incredible. It's the hardest thing about driving one of these nitro cars. I mean, I feel bad for the team because that was obviously a driver error. I mean, it's either open or it's closed, it seems like, and I was getting a handle on it, and it just seemed like the tires hooked up a little harder than I should have. I mean, I should have maybe hit it a little harder to start or got more water in the tires or something. I don't know what's going on. But, uh, Let me tell you something. Take it from an old pro. You did one hell of a job today anyway. Coming from you, that means a lot. Thank you. But there was more pain to be endured by Pat Austin. Kenny Bernstein smoked the tires immediately off the starting line. Pat knew had he only survived the burnout, he would have won it for himself and more importantly for Gary. Labor Day weekend in Indianapolis Raceway Park is the site of the biggest and oldest of the special races within races. We're talking about the Big Bud Shootout for Funny Cars, and these were the eight drivers that competed in this event this year. The final round, who else should meet but Jim White and John Force, just as they had been battling all season long in the Winston Points chase. And Jim White had a stranglehold on this event. He was a low qualifier, had a new national speed record, and John Force saw some of that speed out of the left-hand side of his car as Jim White won the big bud shoot-up. 5, 16, 2, 88. Incredible round. 5, 1, 6, Whoa. 2, 88. Wow. Wow. Wes told me to hang on. He said the air is going to be a little better, and those guys are going to be ready for us. Force, he is a world champion, and you have to be ready for him every time. He raced me in Seattle, and he beat me at the starting line in Seattle. Wes said we're going to be ready for him at the Big Bud Shootout. Jim White and Roland Leong hardly had a chance to celebrate their $50,000 victory because the next day it was back to work. The finals of the U.S. Nationals in Funny Car, their competition. Who else? John Force. That's his crew chief, Austin Coyle. He was trotting back alongside the Castro Oldsmobile. It was a switch of lanes for the two drivers from the day before, but the outcome was certainly no different. John Forrest 
saw a whole lot of the Hawaiian punch guard, even when the roof hatch blew out of it, but that didn't slow it one little bit. Jim White won his first ever U.S. Nationals title, 527, 283 miles per hour. Jubilation at the bar end doesn't even begin to describe it. That was one of those $100,000 plus weekends for Roland Leong, Jim White, and the crew chief, Wes Cerny. Well, Daryl Alderman, we've talked an awful lot about him in this video, but the one thing he had not accomplished in his career was winning the U.S. Nationals. The number one means a lot to any racer, but winning the U.S. Nationals is something you never forget. Larry Morgan knew the feeling. He had won it before and would be tough in the final round between the Dodge and the Oldsmobile. But as usual, Alderman had everything together. Steve, it's remarkable that Alderman can seem to rise to the occasion. When he needs a good reaction time, he can pull it out of the hat, and he certainly got one at the U.S. Nationals. That and the car stuck well in first and second, and the Dodge powered to a victory, a 7.29 to a losing 7.30, and Alderman had his first ever U.S. Nationals crowd. This is another dream come true, as I've been saying. Uh, this is the biggest single event any race car driver could win, and all of us wanted it real bad. Well, here's a guy that wanted it real bad, wants to shake your hand, Larry Morgan. From the immense facility that is Indianapolis Raceway Park, the tour moved to Maple Grove Park for the Sunoco Keystone Nationals. What a contrast from Indy to the countryside of Pennsylvania. But this facility is country in only its setting. It is uptown when it comes to performance, especially if the weather is just right. And the weather was absolutely perfect for drag racing as Vince Curry and Lou Frain's Oldsmobile in the far lane found out when he challenged Darrell Alderman in round number one. The biggest upset in pro stock of the entire season something that hadn't happened all year long. Round one, adios, Alderman. We had uh, problems with this engine earlier in the qualifying, and then this morning uh, when we were setting the clutch gap, or our other motor, the, the good motor, we broke a lifter in it, and we had to switch engines. Well, Vince, this has got to be a real exciting morning for you. Oh, man, it is, especially after what happened at Indy. <laughs> I don't know, I'm lost for words. Well, you ran better than he did, so uh, you should have won. Well, what did it run? <laughs> I still don't know. <laughs> 7.33. Oh, God. i got to step it up, I guess. <laughs> Thanks. Good luck. Alrighty. Vince Corey made it to the final four in Indianapolis just a couple of weeks ago. And at the Keystones, the performance hits just kept on coming. With Alderman out, it was a big opportunity for Warren Johnson to step up and show what he was made of. He started off round one with a new national record 7.180 the quickest run in pro stock history the war was hot oh got a new national record 718. oh don i, I said it was going to be fast out here today the fuel cars all stepped up and there's a lot of fours first round i knew it was going to be fast and then of course uh warren is uh, uh daryl is out so uh well that'll help a little bit the record's another 200 points 250 keep low et things are looking up now he hasn't won the world championship yet, has no, he? No, we're going to fight this thing down to the wire. WJ advanced to round number two, where his competition was the Super Shop Chevy Beretta of Bruce Allen. And Warren Johnson won it. Then in the final four, Bob Glidden and the Ford fell to the charging Oldsmobile till the final round when it was a pair of Oldsmobiles. Mark Powick in the near lane put a huge hole shot on WJ, but Johnson and the AC Delco Oldsmobile at 7.19 to take the victory. Well, I don't know if I won this thing. This car won this thing, and that all the credit goes to Greg and Kurt and Gordy and John and the guys that got this car because I wasn't driving worth a damn today. If you, you know, I mean, some days you can't bowl a strike, you can't hit a home run, and it just was one of those days. The car is what won this race today. Well, then the car took every available point you can win at a national event, a grand total of 1,382. Just enough to tease Warren Johnson into really going for it the remainder of the season against Daryl Alderman. Still a wide points gap, but Warren Johnson, you heard him say, it's going to go down to the wire. Like Warren Johnson dominated this race, Jim White has certainly dominated Funny Car, a 5.15 in qualifying. John Force, a tenth of a second off going into the final. We did what we wanted to do. We made it to the final round, 
you know, nice and calmly to make sure we're going to hang on to our points lead for the year. Now we're going to go for the throat, and like, hopefully, I know how to come up with that 21 or 22 and make this a drag race. And it was a drag race no one will ever forget, especially friends, fans, and crew of the Jim White driven car, the Hawaiian Punch Machine of Roland Leong. Because not only did he drive around John Morris, he set a new national record in the process. 518. But let me tell you what, a new speed record, 289.94. Wow. Thank you, Don. Wes told me that we've just been babying with this thing all day. We put a blower on the semis, as you remember. He said, let's just put a little nitro in it, run it to the finish line this time for the first time. I congratulate Wes Cerny. What a great, great crew chief. White's victory at the Keystone Nationals moved him even closer to John Force, but the Castro Lowell's continued to hold a dominating lead. An impressive performance by White. You know, Joe Amato is a native Pennsylvanian. He lives only a few hours from here, started racing at Maple Grove, but has never won a race here. Is he superstitious? I think so. We've got 3,000 people here cheering for us, and they're putting a lot of pressure on Joe Amato. But, you know, it's always been a jinx. There's a monkey on our back at our home track here in Reading, and uh, this year we kind of took a lot of precaution to really prepare the car real good, and uh, I've even gone and I've got my Italian horn on. My mother-in-law told me where this is real lucky. My mother-in-law's home saying, I got all the old ladies in old Ford saying rosaries for me today, and so we're just going to pray a little extra hard, and hopefully God will be shining on our side. Kenny Bernstein is the only driver that has a shot at putting a stop to Amato's charge to a fourth Winston title. This is a pivotal race in the Winston Championships. You've got to do well here this weekend if you're going to be in this hunt for the points. Have you and your team done anything special for this weekend, or is it just business as usual? I wish we had something special to do, Big, but we don't. We're just doing business as usual, trying to make the car as go as quick and fast and be prepared as we can not to have a mechanical failure. It's going to take everything we can do to keep up with Amato. It is pivotal this weekend. Well, to race Bernstein, Amato rolled to the starting line with a Ziploc bag full of lucky charms stuffed into his fire suit, and apparently something paid off. Watch the Bernstein car, it gets wild. Straight up in the air. Only alert driving by Bernstein prevented a blowover. Only alert driving by Amato presented an upset. What'd you think is this? It was going up. Man, I was mad. I just knew I was gonna have to get out of it and I knew he was he was history. I knew we were, cause we were running good. And I said, man, there it goes up, 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 up. And I, all of a sudden you can just see sky. And I said, that's it, all I can take. <laughs> Off the throttle and crash. And I knew it's coming down hard. I wish lucky didn't go over on us. Don Perdomo is coming down hard on the entire field. He qualified number one at 4.91 seconds against Scott Coletta of 4.96. Then, Corey McLean of the Bill, 4.95. Frank Hawley down the tubes at 4.95. Perdome versus Amato, could he run another four? The question was, could Joe Amato break his jinx and win his first ever race at Maple Grove? Perdome was there to stop him. 4.95, 278 miles an hour, and it was all Perdome this weekend at the Keystone Nationals. The celebration at the finish line between the two drivers, yeah, but Prudhomme had one of the greatest days of his career. His 491 in qualifying was the quickest time he had ever run. Amato held on to the lead over Bernstein and Prudhomme solidified his spot in number three. And did that ever whet everyone's appetite as the tour moved to a super track. In fact, the quickest and fastest drag strip of them all, Heartland Park, Topeka for the AC Delco Heartland Nationals. Steve, after the spectacular performances at the Keystone Nationals, like 34 second runs in one weekend, Jim Murphy beat Dazzled him in Funny Car qualifying at the Heartland race. He took his holy smokes Dodge Daytona to the starting line, but it didn't make it to the finish line in one piece. Well, this brought a whole new dimension to the term flip your lid. Watch this. Cobb, boom. Both parachutes out. Murphy was just fine. We talked with him. Jim, that's got to be one strange sensation, the ultimate sunroof all of a sudden. Exactly, Steve. It was, seemed to be on a pretty decent, you know, seemed to be moving okay, and I think it probably dropped a cylinder or two, and uh, blower, blower backfired. Uh, I'm not sure exactly, probably hydraulic and, and caught a, a valve, and off it came, and all of a sudden we were there with the body on, and all of a sudden it's sunny out. 
you're qualified. The body doesn't look that bad. It's just going to be a long night. Well, that could be. I'm not sure I haven't seen the body or anything yet, but it will be a long night if that's the case. Well, how about a long season? The saga of hard luck Hartman continued at the Hartford National. Watch this poor guy. He lit another one up and another great job of getting the car stopped. Richard, in a situation like that, your talent is as important as the fire bottles. Yeah, you got to get the car stopped and keep it off the guardrail, and sometimes it's hard to do when you're skating around in oil and you got smoke filling up in the cockpit. But that time, luckily, it happened right off the line, and I was able to get it under control pretty quick. It's been a tough year for you, kid. Yeah, real tough. Steve, that was probably the understatement of the entire season. A tough year for Richard Hartman. The funny car star at the Heartland Park race turned out to be none other than Mark Oswald, the only winner this race has ever seen. That's right, in its third annual running, it was Mark Oswald. Here in the final four, he was again John Forbes. John feeling the pressure of the points. Second off the mark, second across the finish line. Oswald wins it by one hundredth of a second. It was an exciting race. They, in and out was right out the window, and uh, we just did all we could this weekend, and uh, we're excited with our car. We're just going to head for Dallas and uh, let someone else try to take that old uh, punch car out. The one that had the opportunity to punch out wide was Mark Oswald, and he took advantage of it. He did it on the starting line. He did it on the finish line. And for the third consecutive year, Mark Oswald, the funny car champ. Well, the great white that couldn't be caught has been reeled in by Mark Oswald. Stunning job, 524. It's not me. It's just everybody on this in and out Burger team. They're tough. You know, Steve, it's been just a Cinderella story with this car. The first race we ever took it to, Gainesville this year, we won with. This is the last race this car will be won at. We took it out winning. So Jeff and Susan Bernstein have been real good to us in, in campaigning this car, and we're just glad we could give them a winner going in and a winner going out. Darrell Alderman should have clinched the Winston Championship at Topeka, but Warren Johnson matched him step for step all weekend. Nonetheless, Alderman won his 10th event of the 1991 season. That was one step Warren didn't take. And as far as the title is concerned, well, it's a mere formality when they get to the next race in Dallas. Another outstanding performance. Darrell Alderman, 10 victories in one season and was more like that 10th victory established a new single season record. The former mark held by Bob Glidden was nine. After the Heartland Nationals, it was down to mathematical possibilities only. Warren Johnson in his quest for a Winston championship to be denied by Darrell Alderman. And Dave, almost any hope there was for Kenny Bernstein to wrest the Winston championship away from Joe Amato took a dark turn at the Heartland Nationals. There you see it. Kenny red-lighted away his chances in the final four. Remember the U.S. Nationals where Pat Austin had a chance to win two national event titles in a single day? Well, at Heartland Park, Topeka, he did it. He beat Chuck Cheeseman in the finals of Alcohol Funny Car. Then he jumped on his scooter and streaked back to the starting line where he climbed back into the Castro Top Fuel Dragster to race against Joe Amato. This was one of the greatest driving jobs I've ever seen. Watch the left side of your screen, the green and white Castrol car. A perfect light is 4-0-0, okay? 4-0-7, he lays on Amato. And at the far end of 4-97, Pat Austin, one of the great ones at 26. That was his first ever four-second elapsed time, and it came in a winning effort. Pat Austin trying to get composed because he knows he just made drag racing history. No one has ever done what you've just accomplished. <laughs> what can you say? I'm... Well, I'll tell you, give you more good news. Your first four second run as well. I told you it was going to come at the right time. He yes, just, you did. He got to set him up, and we set him up and did just what we wanted to do. And you drove the wheels off this race car today. Hey, I got big shoes to fill, and I'm trying to do a good job. Absolutely. Gary would be proud. 26 years of age, he may be the greatest driver this sport has ever seen. The emotion showing in the voice of Pat Austin as he talked with Steve Evans after that record-setting performance. Next was the Super Track. We're talking about the Texas Motorplex just outside of Dallas. Billy Myers' place in the Chief Auto Parts Nationals. But the weather here kind of held everybody back. The temperature in the low 90s, it was windy, and the cars not running as they should. On the sports only all concrete racetrack, all Darrell Alderman had to do was qualify for Pro Stock, and his second Winston Championship was in the bag. He did that handily, and we had a nice conversation. 
Well, that'll do it. Simply by qualifying here in Dallas, Daryl, you are again the Pro Stock Winston champion. Well, that's great, Steve. Uh, you know, it's been an unbelievable year for us, and uh, uh, consistency's what's got us here. Uh, Wayne County Speed Shops just kept this car so consistent this year. I mean, any driver could win. And a record 10 national event wins. Yeah, I know. Someone could have told me at the beginning of the year we was going to win 10 national events, and I'd said, no, I don't believe that. Well, let me show you what it's earned you. Bring it in. Bobby Maston, the Winston Drag Racing team leader, Mickey Netting of RJR, $100,000. Thank Zero. you. Uh -huh. Congratulations. Thank Winston you. Winston brand of cigarettes. Two years in a row, $100,000. You're the champ, buddy. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And Bobby Maston, you have been, well, it'll be 20 races in just two weeks, and you've seen this man and what he's gone through. A great job. The man has just had a fantastic year, and uh, on behalf of the NHRA Winston Drag fans all over the country, Darrell, uh, again, congratulations on a super year. Thank and you've still got a race to win here. Yes, we do. I mean, we're not giving up now. I mean, there's two more races this year, and we'd like to win them both. Go get them. <laughs> Thank you. Well, this one got away from the little Dodge here at the Motorplex as Larry Morgan outpowered him in the final four. Something Morgan had been trying to do for a long time, a 726 to a 729. After this race, Larry Morgan would advance to the finals to race against Warren Johnson, and WJ left a big red light glowing. Larry Morgan, the champion at the Texas Motorplex and the Chief Nationals. Meanwhile, in Bunny Car, John Forrest was trying to clinch his second Bunny Car title. Red Hot again was White, followed by Lota 514, watching as John took on Gordon Minio. Come on, Flash. Come on, Flash. Flash Gordon Minio, as he's called, and about a four-year-old former Blue Max car, right? A drastic contrast in equipment and experience. John Forrest had this one in the bag, right? Wrong. Tires go up at half-track. Minio wins. You're alive more than ever now. We are alive and well. I can't believe they smoked the tires out here like that. They're good guys. They're world champions. I'm glad we don't have to race them next round. In the final of Funny Car, Jim Whitehead did not only win the race, but he also had to set a new national record to give him a real shot at the title at the Winston final. He did not do it. Remember Al Hoffman from the Winston Invitationals? Here he is again, the winner. So John, it's over. That's it. That's it. I can't even believe it. Finally over. Yeah, and I'm still sick. I'm in shock. I got to see this boy Hoffman. Well, I don't think they went for the record. I don't know what they did. I don't even care. I'm going home. It's done. I survived another year. Awesome. All John Force has to do is qualify at the Winston Finals, and he's got his second consecutive title. And at Dallas, Jack Ostrander had his second disaster in 1991. Remember Sonoma, that horrible bar end crash? Well, watch one more time as Jack Ostrander goes for a horrible ride. The chassis broke just behind the engine. The car makes contact engine first with a wall, and he came by me with a sickening, grinding sound. More good news. Jack Ostrander was helped from that race car and did not even go to the hospital. The emergency crew checked him out on the scene. He was found to be okay. His four-year-old car, when the parachutes came out, separated right behind the engine, pulling the entire rear end off the car. Ostrander again for a wild ride. Chuck Ostrander shaken, obviously, but uh, he has survived his second terrible accident of the season. You okay, Jack? Sure. I don't know what happened. I don't think anybody's sure what happened. A lot of things may have happened. I don't know. The motors look like it's still together. I don't, you know. Two in one season, that's more than any man ought to have to experience. One's enough. Believe me. One's too many. He's fine. In the first round of elimination, the leader in the Winston points chase, Joe Amato, fell to Maurice DuPont. That opened the door for Kenny Bernstein, who would have to win this Chief Nationals, find Joe Amato going out in round one at the Winston Finals, and Bernstein winning that event as well. This is the time you're glad you've got such a huge points lead. You may need it. Yeah, you know, it's never easy, I guess, in racing. You know, you never know what's going to happen. You know, just an unfortunate situation. We'll be watching Bernstein, all of us together. Yeah, it'll be interesting. Kenny, there's a teeny little light at the end of the tunnel here with the motto out. It's a little bitty one, but certainly that's what has to happen is him to go out early and us to keep winning for us to ever catch him. But it's still a long way, but at least maybe there's a chance. And it's worth it not to lean on this thing. Maybe take some chances. Going to have to, I think, especially if we ever get to the final and have to run for Dome because we sure can't run 92 like this. But we're, we're consistent. That's what we need to be. Great job. 
and lo and behold, it was Don Perdome that Kenny Bernstein met in the finals. The Bernstein team had lived up to the pressure, but in the final, Perdome was just too strong. A repeat of the final in Montreal with opposite results. Joe Amato loved that one. Don Perdome wins the Chief Nationals in Dallas. Joe Amato can afford to relax a little bit. All he has to do now is win the first round at the Winston Finals. For Prudhomme, what a turnaround from the problem plague season of 1990. Well, 1991 ended right where it began. The Los Angeles County Fairplex and the Winston Finals. A huge crowd on the second weekend following a rainout. Didn't dampen their enthusiasm one little bit. Now, Joe Amato, as we said, had to win in round number one to clinch the title. He was up against Oklahoma's Jimmy Nix, and he did exactly that. Amato had qualified number two at a 494. Very good on this pavement. Nix was the 15th qualifier. This was it for Joe Amato in his Valvoline special. Beat Nix, count the money. No problem. A 495 did it. Great job. That's unbelievable, Steve. You know, the pressure all year has been crazy. You know, it's been an up and down year, and we come true, and my true came true. And uh, for Team Valvoline to win two championships like this here, I mean, they just did a, such a good job. I mean, we had a lot of pressure and a lot of mailocks in our pit for the last month, but uh, what can I say? Four times, I put this on a special pedestal in the world. And you did it in style with a 495. You broke his back. If we're going to do it, we might as well do it and go out being a, on the top of the shelf. Now we'd like to win the race. That'll be the icing and the cake. Well, this was the day that the icing melted and ran off the cake for Joe Amato. The car would not start in his second round race against Corey McLenathan. But bear in mind, Joe Amato, the only four-time Winston champ. What in the world has happened? Well, we've had this problem three separate times at this race. It's not pulling the fuel up. Somewhere in the, uh, in the intake line, we have an air leak, and it's stuck in air. Well, I'm sure it seemed to everybody that this was anticlimactic. The motto was out, ground the champion. All Corey Mack had to do was make a single. Well, it broke right up the starting line. The blower pop. A simple single run, right? Uh-uh. Only Corey Mack knew that he was sitting in a runaway. He started waving in case any of the emergency trucks might come out on the track. When the blower banged, it opened up the fuel system. It was sucking air and fuel into the engine right here. He is burning up the brakes on that car. Instead of losing speed, he is picking up speed. What to do? What any train driver will do at Pomona. Take it into the emergency sand trap and into the net. With disastrous results to the car, the fuel tank flying out, exploding. You see it on the left. The good news, Corey Mack was OK. What an incredible job by Corey McLenathan. He had the opportunity to take a left-hand turn, but as the car had neared that sand trap at the end of the racetrack at Pomona, it actually began to pick up speed. McLenathan got out of the car under his own power. Watch closely. You can see a very slight flash right there when the supercharger let go. That, in turn, stuck the throttle open and carried McLenathan all the way down to the end, building up speed across the sand until it ran into the catch net at the end a huge rope affair off of an aircraft carrier used here to stop a runaway race car. Well, Corey, you knew you had a runaway car before any of us did. Yeah, I mean, in that, something in that case, I didn't know what to do. I couldn't unstick the throttle. I pulled the parachutes. I did everything that they give us for safety-wise to stop the car other than using my feet. You know, I don't know. There wasn't a dang thing I could do. I didn't want to go through the parking lot. It might hurt somebody else. I had to do what they make these things for, I'd drive it right through the sand. You did a fine job. Thank you very much. Corey McLenathan uninjured, but we can't say the same for his race car. In the final of Top Fuel, Pat Austin got revenge on Kenny Berenstein for the U.S. Nationals and finished the season with a shot over the bow of all Top Fuelers concerning next season. The Castro crew celebrating Walt Austin is dead, having all the confidence in the world in that 26-year-old driver. And the question is, what kind of impact is he going to have on the 1992 Winston Points chase? You could not now, after what you've seen, forget Al Hoffman and his crew chief, Tommy Anderson. They won their second national event title, along with the Winston Invitational, a pretty good payday. Al Hoffman actually outdrove John Forrest in the final four. That didn't mean a thing to this hometown crowd. The Southern Californians cheered one of their own all the way up the Pomona return road. 
And what more can you say about Daryl Alderman winning his 11th title at Pomona and the Winston Championship for the second year in a row. Quite a season for that little dog. All in all, David, it was quite a season for all of us that love NHRA Championship Drag Racing. Whether uh, men fortunate as we are to uh, handle the television chores, if you can call that a chore, the fans, the racers, all of us adore it 91. For Drag Racing 91, I'm Dave McClellan. And I'm Steve Evans. We'll see you next year.